welcome back to another episode of the carrot and stick podcast now if you caught our last two episodes i hope you found loads of value because this one is absolutely packed with it we have a good chat with alex gilbert the lnd manager at 11 investments an investment group that invests into recruitment companies of which they currently have six and he's responsible for everything from someone's initial onboarding through to retaining them training them further and making sure he's analyzing data the whole way through to make sure someone is delivering those who know alex will know that he is packed full of energy the guy does simply not stop he's incredibly bouncy he's also believe it or not a amateur pro wrestler i guess goes under the name of dow jones who knew i found out today and it was a really fun conversation but if you're looking at ways that you can better onboard people make them more successful after you've hired them make sure you're retaining them and honestly so many more nuggets of knowledge this is the episode for you so let's get away from all the fluster and the stuff at the start of a podcast let's get into it and i hope you enjoy this one awesome alex thank you so much for speaking to me mate really appreciate you making time on this wonderful friday afternoon are you ready for a few beers this weekend uh, I, do you know I'm a non-drinker, so I'm definitely You're... ready for some Red Bulls. That's my. I was point. about to say, the energy has got to come from somewhere. If not from booze, <laughs> it's got to come from something. And energy drinks fits the bill. There we go. Uh, <laughs> yes, thank you for having me, sir. Can't wait to to have a chat and catch up. Oh, mate, you've won up me on the shirts big time as well. See, normally outside of the business with the shoutcasting work that I do, I wear the fancy shirts. I'm always the guy who's got the flowery, colourful shirts. But you have outdone me today. So fair play, oh, sir. You. Fair play. Right, let's dig into things then. Um, we were talking a little bit before the show, and I was saying, you know, if we look back at your career, you've had some really cool experiences, but it mainly started at Vanquist as a product specialist. And since then, it's kind of grown mainly in recruitment through being L and D manager, helping out a little bit, as you said, with things like IT as you get tech. And you've been through one of our competitors, Cube19. You worked there for a while as well. Dude. So you've got a really interesting angle, I think, on this whole topic around sales management and motivation, where things like learning and training come. So... To start things off, I always love getting into the meat and potatoes early on. Tactical advice that we can talk about for managers. Listen to this. If they were to walk away from this with up to maybe three lessons that they could learn and take away from your experiences overall, how would you summarize them down? And we'll dig into them more as we go through the podcast as well. Now, great, great question. Um, I, I think it is as simple as the onboarding. How are they onboarded into a business? Mm -hmm. How are you retaining those people? So I always think of like a bath. It's all well and good filling it up. If you've got to plug the other end that's empty, yeah, that's going to be difficult. And then the third one, I haven't got a nice posh word for it, but just how are you checking? How are you maintaining? How do you know that you're, what you're doing is good? And so, so in summary, onboarding, how are you getting people on? How are you keeping those people and how, like, how are they continuing? Mm. And then actually, how are you checking in on them? How are you checking in? It's almost like are you getting feedback on how well you're managing them, how well they're being supported, right? absolutely mm, okay how you collect feedback can be the third one and we will dig into that as we go along so i guess nice. first and foremost i love digging into titles as well because i speak to people who have got like global sales leader in one job the next one they're a vp of revenue they sound worlds apart but actually there's a lot of similarities so l d manager at 11 investments yes what is that role responsible for give me the oh. rundown the rundown. Well, I am responsible for anyone that is brand new that wants to get into recruitment via 11 Investments. I suppose if I go back a bit, 11 Investments is essentially a group of recruitment businesses. So I have the unique privilege of technically being the head of L&D or sorry, L&D manager of six recruitment businesses, all with slight nuances, all with slightly different things. So I'm responsible that when someone joins, that they are equipped, be it technologically, um, be it through knowledge, be it through skill, that they can actually do the job that they've been employed to do. If they've been super experienced, that's great, but they've still got to learn the tech. And if someone's brand new as a graduate, they might be super clever, but they've still got to learn the techniques. So it's my job to bring it all together. And in a nice soundbite for your editor that can edit this later, it's my job to get people knowing everything as quick as physically possible. As physically possible. I like it. I got a quick question to ask around that then to dig into it for a second. Yeah. To what level do you engage the manager of a team to help on board or train this person as well? Because I imagine there are times where a manager has a way of doing things. You on board someone, you teach them the way of doing things that it may be your view of the best way of doing things, but a manager might not agree. How do you address that? Oh, every, every day. <laughs> i thought day. the answer there was going to be i don't <laughs> so the um the best way i, I like to phrase it i always get them involved always goes without saying and i think some lnd professionals 
can feel like they know better. Oh, no, no, this is how people learn. This is how things do. But actually, boots on the ground, you're in that team, you're managing that team. Now, don't get me wrong, you also have to take some bits of feedback with a pinch of salt. So what I tend to do, what my strategy is, is I go, here is a framework. I, when I first joined 11 Investments, I sat down with the directors and I said, in your opinion, do not take anyone else's opinion. In your opinion, what are the essential things that someone needs to know by the end of month one and then maybe at the end of one, uh, one year? And I would sit with them and I would try not to give them too many answers, but they would give me 10, 20, sometimes 100 answers. I then take that and then sort of collaborate everything together and then go, right, according to, in an 11 investments case, according to the nine various heads of departments and, and senior leaders, they believe that, and I literally write down, and you're going to laugh at this one, there's about 700 different things. <sighs> Jesus. So many things, right? I need to know how to make a good cup of tea. Yeah, right? It's, <laughs> all joking aside, uh, something I learned when I was at Vanquist was they had a fridge that had like a timed lock. So if you open the fridge and then closed it, it would not open again for 30 seconds. I put that in the induction training. And the reason why is because the amount of people that would go, oh, I forgot the milk, and then would almost break the door trying to get it off. God. And so although, Derry, you made that as a joke, this is the thing about L&D that... We assume people know things. We assume they Assumptions are dangerous, right? They make an ass out of you and me. Yay! Classic line. Can we One of my favourite lines. <laughs> so <laughs> it's my job to... So to come back to your question, sorry, is I get them involved, but there are sometimes nuances. So I have a framework. These are... And I'm going to use the 700 as the example. By the end of... Again, how long is a piece of string? But I would go like, in, by the end of one month, I can guarantee that your new person will know 60% of these. And these are the ones that I'm going to focus on. The remaining 40%, that's going to happen over time. Is there anything else that you would like me to prioritize? And that mm. tends to be how I phrase it, rather than what do you want me to do? Because there's everything. What can I focus on first? And it tends to be that's where the manager will then go, do you know what? Actually, this person, they're joining a warm desk. We've got lots of clients that we need to reach out to. So, And then they might not know, but then I can piece it together. Ah, okay. If they've got warm clients. That means they're on the system. They want to outreach to those people. Okay, so they're probably going to need to know a little bit more about the techie side to get going. And then I need to check their understanding of what outreach sounds and looks like, what they might do, and fill in the gaps from there so you're less bothered about new business at that point it's much more about here's existing it's literally customizing it and tailoring it to an individual person if they are going into a cold desk you'll focus mm -hmm. on business development skills correct right? yeah absolutely Interesting. and of course it will happen so again if you think we've got six different businesses it will happen and it has happened where i'll have half the room that are going to be joining warm desks and i'll have half the room that are going to be brand new so I think of it as part of my responsibility. You look at the training and you go, okay, well, what's universal? Okay, right. And these are made up numbers, Derry, but it might be like, okay, I've worked out approximately 80% of this particular material of this induction. That's unanimous. That goes across mm. the board. But then the individual bits, you go, okay, I've got three people, two of which have got loads of experience. And I've got one person with a little bit of experience. And again, you try and tailor it to go, okay. They definitely know how to use LinkedIn Recruiter, and I've checked that during their induction, because that's the other thing as well that I find is funny. People's self-awareness of what they know. What they know say and what is the reality can be very different. Oh, and that has been my undoing when I've made mistakes. It's because I've assumed. Oh, I was about to say, again, it's an assumption, right? Because people, will, people don't want to sound like an idiot. They want to say, oh, yeah, of course I know how to use it. Oh, I know how to use CRM. It's no problem. But in reality, the actual depth of understanding, it's a very shallow layer that they actually understand right absolutely and this mm. is where i know we're going to talk about it but this is where i like tech telling me things because you don't know what you don't know and so i'm a huge formula one fan they use data all the time for everything and the best f1 teams can predict a problem coming ah the front left tire is overheating. That could be because of airflow, debris, whatever it might be. So they can, they can see the data, they predict it. That's what I think my job is, is to go, okay, I can see the, let's use the CRM, I can see the CRM. Oh, they're, they're sending out a lot of CVs, but they're mm. not seemingly converting them to interviews or placements. Okay, let's now investigate what the problem could be. 
are they sending bad CVs? Is the writing of the, of the CV write-ups not so good? And that's where I think that's my bread and butter of the job. And that's, guess, where you get involved as they go into their kind of like, you know, three, six, nine months in the role, whereas at the start, it's much more about what do you need to get started than ongoing. It's say, how can we refine this and make it better, right? Million percent. Interesting. It's walk before you can run. And then once mm. you can run, maybe you can tackle a 5K. I wouldn't tell people to go, let's run a marathon now. That would be <laughs> insane. And that's recruitment. Yeah. Interesting. I mean, this is a really good point to dig into that a little bit further because even we as a business, we're at 40 people almost now. We don't have like a formalized L&D onboarding scheme. We have like a document on our internal documentation. It's called Slight. Great bit of kit. We have like a 30, 60, 90 day doc where we say, okay, after 30 right. days, you want to be able to do this. After 60 this, after 90 that. And we list a bunch of the things like here's key bits of software you need to be able to log into. Here's that. But we assume naturally that they can look, they can understand or figure a lot of these things out for themselves. So when you're putting this down on paper for anyone to be able to see, whether it's the individual going through onboarding, whether it's their manager, whether it's you, what does this look like in the actual reality and in the tactical implementation of it? Oh, great question, Jerry. I've never been asked that question in those words. So I just imagine at some point there'll be a leader or a manager listening to this thinking, you know what, actually, oh, they, these guys have got it down. They know what to do with L&D. We need something like that. And so now I'm trying to get all these nuggets out of your brain for them. <laughs> <laughs> that's fair. That's fair. So I think your, your 30, 60, 90 is a great idea. And I, I use the phrase checkpoint rather than test. So uh, if you test someone, it sounds like you're having a go at them. I'm testing yeah. you on this knowledge. You can you fail. Just, you can be blah, blah, blah. You can get told yeah. off all that kind of stuff don't want that if you think of it if you hire anyone be it on your entry level job or a way more senior person if someone doesn't understand something i'm sure you've you've even probably had the conversation with me where you look at them and you go i don't think you get what i'm saying <laughs> and so sometimes you have to find ways to check and as you say, there's a lot of people that don't want to be seen as stupid, silly. They don't want to look like they don't know what they're doing. So I think with an L&D function, and you complimented my shirt earlier, which was, uh, thank you very kindly. You're welcome. One thing I try and do is I try and be Mr. Friendly. And I say to people like, look, I, we're on the same team. For, and if I'm honest with you, for you to do, sorry, for me to do my job properly, I kind of need you to tell me if there's even the tiniest of things you're not sure of. So I'll get asked questions from, as you just said, they're like strategically, tactically, here's these questions. But sometimes I get, Alex, how, how do I turn this on? And, and I guess the nice thing is they're not saying that to their manager, right? Who would be like, have I hired an idiot here? Whereas you're just like, oh, well, I'm, I'm not aligned towards whether this works out or not in a way. I'm just here to teach you as much as I can, right? Exactly that. Yeah. And this is where I can fall down because there's almost like the difference between productivity and being busy. So I will get a lot of questions that might be a little bit quick. They might be short answers. At the end of the day, I go, wow, I've answered about 200 questions. The bit coming to tactically, the bit that I still need to improve on myself, is as an example in the recruitment world, I'll get someone that approaches my desk. And one of my favorite things is when they approach, with, approach me with their laptop, they go, Alex, I need you to help me build this search. I'm trying to find X, Y, Z. I've done this and I'm not getting results, but I know there's more people. So I'll sit there for 10 minutes and it's a bit of coaching. Okay, why are you using that word? How about this? Use this. Then they walk away. Now, I should get better at logging this because let's say there's a quick fix. Oh, actually, did you know you could do this kind of a search? <gasps> no, I didn't. And then they find 20 candidates and then they place three of them. They ask me, it took 10 minutes and it's made them, I'm going to make up numbers, £30,000. Yeah. If they never ask the L&D person, they A, may never have found out and B, if they did find out, it might have taken them weeks. And that's the value I think I can, like if I can defend L&D in all these worlds, we can speed up a lot of processes. You see, I think in, in another world, this is often called sales enablement is what we have mm. sometimes in SaaS. Although some would argue it's not quite the same thing. Sales enablement is about enabling sellers to be as productive as possible, which essentially is what you're doing. You are enabling them to be successful. I love that. I'm going to pocket that. I'm going to add that to my CV. Thank you. <laughs> Recruiter enabler. That'll be the next little <laughs> spin out solo business you do at some point, mate. I'm love sure. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Now, that's all super helpful, mate. Like, so basically the sort of takeaways I'm getting from that is sit down with anyone who kind of like has responsibility for this directors, managers, whoever, and go, okay, then what has this person got to know after X time period? It can be a week. It can be a month. It can be three months. It can be a year get all that written down essentially distill it down into a list that makes sense for the majority say 80 percent of those that you'd on board specialize 20 percent of the content to make sure it's more engineered for those that are going into more specific roles or filling specific mm -hmm. needs inside the business 
And then again, kind of how are you then maintaining that one-to-one -one with the individual? Have they got a document they can reference? Or? Oh, so this is a great question, Derry. So like I use the phrase, you don't know what you don't know, but you also don't want to embarrass someone. So something I have tried, and it seems to work, but it is quite tedious, is if you, can, if you have the resources to go, at, let's use sales as the example, right? They've got to use a LinkedIn recruiter or LinkedIn navigator to find whatever. You could almost go like a tick list going, so this is what I've done. I know how to filter people via groups. And then if they look at that and they go, I don't understand a single word of that. They now know, right, that's a gap in my knowledge mm. immediately. And then they can come to me and go, Alex, I've done. So imagine there's a hundred of these. They go, do you know, there are 15 things here that make no sense to me. Me as the L&D professional, great. You've just made my life easier. So it might have taken me a day to build this document. But every day going forward, every single onboarder at day 30, day 60, day 90, whatever it might be, they can present this document going, do you know what? According to your list, I'm still missing 25%. Can you help mm. me? Yeah. That's my sneaky tactic for you. Mm, I love that, mate. Honestly, super valuable stuff. Thank you. Like that's even that's the onboarding part. We haven't gotten to retention or feedback collection yet. <laughs> no. But we will come on to that. I do want to take a small break in the middle and ask you that you are probably one of the most bouncy people that I think I know in the sales world. You are you remind me in a way of Mark who works for me, my SDR manager. We put you in a room together, there would be no end to conversation. You would Correct. both be dying of like dehydration before you stop talking. It would get to that sort of level. What is it that drives you? What gives you this bounce? Oh, what a great question. Well, the obvious joke is energy drinks, right? That's the obvious joke. Let's get that out of the way. <laughs> the Red right? Bull. <laughs> yeah, let's get that out of the I'll, way. I'll have to reach out to see if they'll sponsor the podcast for us. <laughs> oh, that'd be dangerous. Um, <laughs> I suppose, if, I, if I'm honest with you, it's enjoying what you do. I like, I like talking to people. And it's ironic because I feel like I've learned this behavior. I don't think it's actually natural. And... If I got out my old like school report, it'd be like, Alex is shy, quiet, keeps himself to himself. And then I've fallen into this L&D role. And I think the word, I'm going to use the word passion. I have a passion for doing things right or doing mm. things well and being proud of what you're doing. But also when I learned that it's okay to not know something and it's okay to ask a question. Yes, I've been embarrassed many a time asking a question. And actually in a big business or even a smaller business, the L&D function, if, if someone's listening to this who is in L&D, the day I realize that it's my job to ask questions so that someone else doesn't look silly, that was the day where I went, I've, I've nailed this job now, I understand. I'm allowed mm. to ask those questions. Explain to me in your own words how this would, when really in the back of my mind I go, I have no idea what he's about to say. Um, but the bouncy thing, I think it's just purely like, no, hi, I, I want to do the best. And if I was... <laughs> I think if you are deeply a cynical person, um, and I do sometimes fall into that trap, if you're cynical, I find <laughs> that the world disappoints you all the time. Yeah. And if you're expecting failure, you're going to get it. And I was very privileged. This is a name drop. Apologies. I had uh, a very strange like meet and greet experience with the former uh, champion boxer, Chris Eubank. Hmm. And he was talking about... So I'm obsessed by people that win things. Like, so I go to a lot of sporting uh, meet and greet events, mainly because I want to hear about their mindset. And they talk about the moment I thought I might not win, I've lost. And I think it's the same principle with the approach to your day. If you go into your day going, oh, this is going to be miserable. Oh, this is going to be terrible. Well, it probably, you're going to manifest that. You it's, lose it's yourself going... before you lose the game, right? Absolutely. And mm. so to answer your question... Like now, I'm going into this like video call, uh, being very honest with everyone listening. I'm, go I'm still very honoured that you've asked me on here. But in my mind, I'm honestly thinking, why is he talking to me? He's got so many way more important people that he could be speaking to. <laughs> but, but if I, now I like to think that that hasn't come across, but that is honestly what's in my mind. So I approach the call going, well, he has asked me. I've mm, been in I have. There, mu <laughs> there must be something. So I'm going to. Kevin just stuck in here uninvited, Alex. I wasn't expecting <laughs> a different Alex to turn up for the call. Don't worry. <laughs> so I, I sort of approach it going, well, actually, let's flip it. Everything that I'm saying negatively, the negative speech, let me actually process that the complete opposite. I, why am I on it? Well, actually, you know, I do do L and D things, and you've met so many people. I appreciate there probably are some other people that you could have on, but you've chosen me great mm. let's explore this and coming back to sales how many times i can only speak when i used to do sales roles if you think you can't sell this thing to that person you've given yourself an excuse 
And so I think that's the same principle with recruitment or any role, is that the moment you go, eh, I'm just going to sit back and not bother, well, you've ruined it for yourself. Completely agree. It's a really interesting point. And to kind of address the, the, the point there around, like, oh, there might be someone else you can speak to, someone more senior. Yeah. But the whole vibe of the podcast for me is I actually think there are just as many lessons in someone who's managing a small team in a company of thousands as there is a director of that team right if you want like mm. someone who knows about strategy you speak to a director if you want someone who knows about tactical execution of managing a team you speak to a team manager not the director right mm. chances are those at the very top end of it haven't managed a direct report of someone who's actually at the front line executing for a long long time so i think there's so much value in speaking to people who are in that day to day that we wouldn't normally see because on podcasts you get the the big names, the CEOs, the sales directors, right? You miss so many learnings, I think, along the way that that's largely why I do it. I think it's just so valuable to hear from people like yourself. So don't write yourself off, mate. You're doing yes. great. And I'm really, I'm really enjoying it. That, those first 15 minutes, mate, gold dust, trust me. That stuff about onboarding, <laughs> I'm taking away some lessons from that. So do not worry. It's not just listeners. It's also me here. The truth <laughs> is, this is not about the listeners. It's about my own learning. That's what we'll take from that one. Now, one really fun thing I do want to dig into about you again before we get onto the retention thing is wrestling. <laughs> now i'm sure you can talk for hours about this like of you course. and i have a very similar kind of like pastime outside of the business of commentary on a sport of some kind me on competitive video games you on wrestling but your <laughs> passion for wrestling mate is something i've never seen it's unbelievable <laughs> where does that come from how did you get into it i've got to hear this story <laughs> You're correct. I could talk about this forever. So I'm going to try and do this as short as I can. 30 so... minutes later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I must have been like five years old when I first watched it. So I'm 36 now to give context. So I would have grown up in the era of, you know, like Hulk Hogan, Bret Hart, these kind of names. Matt British Hardy was my favorite back in the ah, day. Right. So this is one of my favorite things to do is I like to ask people that have watched it. Oh, who do you like? Because I can then build a timeline to go, right, if you're saying Matt and Jeff Hardy, this could be anywhere between sort of 2000 up to about 2005, maybe 2006. Favourite the... match I ever watched was Matt, uh, Matt and Jeff versus the Bubba Boys. It was a table oh, match and they had like a, table... a three-stack table. It was incredible. Royal Rumble 2000 is what I'm guessing. Um, you may well know it. It was yeah, amazing, it's... mate. I'm, I'm that. So people are really passionate about football and I get that. And I, I'm big on Formula One and I watch these sports like people watch football. Like it, it's just a part of my identity. It's, all, it's always been around. And I can't remember how old I was. I'm going to say 10. I was a bit late to this, but I didn't realize it was not real. I genuinely thought it was real for a long time. <laughs> Me neither until I was in my teenage years. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> And so I suppose most people go like, oh, it's fake. Oh, I'm, I'm going to watch something else now. But I had the opposite where it was like, oh, my God, it's, it's predetermined. Oh, my God, I could do this. And so I sort of never grew up. And I had a bit of a deal with my mum. Look, OK, I'll get my degree. I'll do that. But once I've got my degree, I'm going to pursue this. So from the age of 21, it was like, right, what wrestling training camps and schools? And so I, to give it, if anyone is listening who is a wrestling fan, so I've, I've met people like Edge, uh, I've met The Undertaker, I've met John Cena, I've met, like, these are big names, but I've trained with, um, like, Mick Foley. Oh, uh, really? I've done a session with Matt Hardy, funnily enough. Uh, did a session with, who's another good name to drop? Uh, but I've done all these sessions. I'm obsessed by it. Because, but it, it's not necessarily because I wanted to do it. It's just... I wanted to learn it. I want to know everything there is about this thing that I love. And I channel that, I'm going to use the word passion, there's probably a better word, into my real job. Because mm. I find like wrestling, when you talk to people about wrestling, they're like, well, that's that weird, like fake thing. And it's like, no, there's so much to it. Let me tell you more. And then I get people to get almost sucked in. So let me give you a 30 second pitch for you. And hopefully I can intrigue Testing you. Testing like, your sales skills here. <laughs> so like, if you watch a mar so when people go like, oh, it's fake, it's not worth watching, I feel sorry for you because does that mean you don't watch Marvel films? Does that mean you don't watch a soap opera? Does that mean that you don't even watch most reality television? It's scripted, I'm afraid. But you check your uh, reality at the door. You accept what's going on. The thing about those things I've just mentioned, plus many, many more, it's a static experience. You sit there, you watch, that is it. The thing about professional wrestling that I absolutely love is that the moment you walk in the door at any show that I am on or a show that I promote, you are involved in the show the moment you're in there. You can be as involved as you like or not. You can sit at the back and just watch or you can sit in the front row and high five every single good guy that you like and get in the face of every bad guy that you don't like. The amount of time someone has said something in the audience, I have stopped doing what I'm doing to then walk over to the camera, over to their like chair and then go, 
you, say that again to my face. And you can see the look of fear going, whoa, I wasn't expecting that. And then the good guy wrestler comes out, chases me away, off we go. The person in the audience, that you are in the show. You can That's dictate amazing. what happens. No other, I get people talk about pantomime, but pantomime is still a scripted process. Mm. Pro wrestling is as scripted or as not scripted as you wanted it to be. I think it is the greatest form of sports, athleticism, acting, drama, comedy, whatever you want to call it, any combo, you get it in pro wrestling. And it's been my life's mission to try and show people how I see it through my lens. So Monday to Friday, I'm Mr. Learning and Development, I'm Mr. Recruitment, whatever. But Saturdays and Sundays, I'm that guy that wears the spandex in front of hundreds and thousands of people. And I, I almost live for the, the booing. I enjoy it. I'm <laughs> are, you the, are you the villain? I tend to be, yes. So the character I have traditionally played for the last 15 years is a character called Dow Jones. And in my mind, I play for comedy. So Dow Jones is the American like stock market, the, the stock exchange. But it sounds like a person. So I was like, well, I could be that person. But to give you context, like I walk out, if I'm wearing a top hat, oh, this guy must be rich. And it's all stereotypes, if, if I'm honest. And boo, don't like the rich person. But I have like finishing moves like the credit crunch, the pound stretcher. You know what I mean? Like, That's just, amazing. Just have fun with it. And yeah. so I love bleeding that into if I talk work again. I think there's so many parallels. So like in wrestling, to, as a quick um, side note, you'll get the promoter go like, it's you against you, that person's going to win, and that's about it. But a bit like in L&D, I'll get told by a director or a manager, oh, yeah, uh, blah, 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 and blah, 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 need training. But the really good wrestlers and the really good trainers go back and push back and go, why? Let me understand why. Why is that person winning this match? Why does this person need sales training? And if they're like, well, because I just want to, that's not good enough. Okay, well, It needs why... to be a compelling story or a compelling yes, reason. Yeah, exactly. And so I, what I love about my position, especially on LinkedIn, and this is where I think the passion comes across, is that on paper, you would never go pro wrestling and learning and development are similar. Mm -mm. To me, they are identical. The way you make it and the way you execute it are almost the same. And it fascinates me how the pro... So what I love is that although Monday to Friday I'm doing L&D, Saturday, Sunday I'm doing uh, wrestling, actually seven days a week I'm doing the same thing just mm. executed differently. And so coming back to L&D, when people talk about training, like training recruiters, training sales teams, training audit teams, to me, it's the same thing. It's just how you execute it that changes. You're a passionate guy, but there was a level of intensity to that that was quite chilling, actually, in a very good way. <laughs> You're going to have to, I mean, look, I, I, I could sit here again and keep on talking about this for like hours. This is a really interesting conversation. But I imagine most of us are going, is this a wrestling podcast or a yeah. podcast? <laughs> let's move on, let's move so, on. So what I do have to ask, though, if I do want to, because I'm actually quite curious now to come to an event at some point. I really want to see the pound stretcher getting dropped on some poor fool spread out on the mat. Where would I go to find out more information? Let's do oh, a little plug for the wrestling here. Oh, that's very kind. So I now promote what's called United Kingdom Pro Wrestling, UKPW. If you search that on Instagram and Facebook, if you type the word wrestling in there as well, we're the number one option that comes up. We're actually on local television in um, Kent on KMTV. Mm. But yeah, UKPW.shop is probably the best one-stop shop to go to amazing well maybe at some point we love doing our team meetups every three months we'll make a wrestling meetup at some point <laughs> you'll have one up all cheering for dow jones <laughs> i can't wait so mate good. that is that is incredible amazing um cool so a lovely little segue here it's all about retaining people in wrestling let's talk about retaining people in the business as well so that was kind of your second bit the first one was around onboarding we spoke through that sort of stuff and about the passion all that kind of good stuff and keeping energy up when it comes to retaining people, what have you got for me on that? Well, I'm going to go a different angle. So for the okay. record, 11 Investments are very proud of our retention rates. Uh, a lot of businesses I've worked in um, have had very good retention rates. And uh, the short answer is training, L&D, continuous improvement. That is the short answer for, for retention. Because if you're, if you're not, what's that quote? If you're not earning and you're not learning, then go. And I quite like that sort of jokey phrase. But to go from a different angle, the retention part, actually, I think it's often overlooked that it's also to do with your onboarding. Hear me out. If you get your onboarding wrong, you're not going to retain that person because they don't know how to do the job. They don't know if they have a bad day and they had a bad onboarding, why are they going to stay? Mm. So I say to people casually, I feel like I'm giving away too much by saying this, but... Do it. If you have an 
excellent day one, like the best day one in the world. I think you've just bought yourself a couple of weeks of bad. Yes. If you have an incredible week one, I think you've bought yourself an incredible quarter, if you see where I'm coming from. Yeah. So I think that onboarding bit is actually the secret recipe for the retention bit. Because if something's wrong and the onboarding was bad, you're never going to work it out. But if you know that your onboarding is spot on, now the question of how do you know that, that's a different question. But if you get incredible onboarding, it just leans into retention because you've set the people up for success, not set them up for failure. And that's the retention piece for me. Interesting. I absolutely love that. So onboarding is the most important bit. That's already been established. It's the secret recipe <laughs> of Mr. Gilbert. Correct. Training. Talk to me about frequency. Talk to me about oh. schedule. Do you sit there and say, here's what I'm going to teach you over the next nine months? Do you let them pick and choose what they want to learn and when? Do you prescribe it all? Give us some tactical tips. Well, if I'm honest, if you have the ability, if you have the resources to be able to go, here is a smorgasbord of everything, do that. If you have the resources to have on-demand learning, in-class training, webinar, hybrid, if you can do everything, do everything is, is the quick answer. But if you're a smaller business or you have less resources or less time, I think the first question is you have to be a little bit tactical and think, okay, if my onboarding is really good, is there anything in the onboarding that I can convert to be digital? Because then they can drop into that training when they need it. Yes. So there's this concept called, so schools, when we go to school, so for anyone that's listening that didn't enjoy school for various reasons, that's because school does what's called just in case learning. You need to learn this just in case, but most of the time you don't. But Just in case it comes upon an exam. Yeah, or even just yeah. in case you're ever on the TV show Pointless and you need to answer what the king and queens were. <laughs> yeah. You get the idea. I'm a bit sour about this because I feel like we lose a lot of fantastic people because we, we tell kids, learn all of this stuff. I could not tell you anything about the kings and queens of this country, but I could tell you every single Royal Rumble and WrestleMania main event because I'm interested in those topics. But Absolutely. in my world, that's actually useful, but the kings and queens aren't. So yeah. I so change the logic of just in case because you learn everything just in case change it to just in time mm. we need to learn this just in time so when you have an L&D professional in theory they can build a program where they learn things just in time so in recruitment it's quite good because you you get people to learn how to talk to candidates how to screen them how to get them to get an interview but you don't necessarily have to train them about necessarily the placement process or the aftermath of that, because that's week one, week two. They probably need that, I'm going to finger in the air, you might be six weeks, eight weeks, even six months, depending on the kind of recruitment you're doing. So a professional will look down and go, well, actually, when do they need this? So you learn how to process an interview. My goal is to do that the day before they actually do it. Now, there are times where I get it wrong, because sometimes some people are so good, and sometimes they're lucky that they're able to get that done before my plan. So you do have to take on board that, okay, right, there are going to be the odd times where I'm going to have to do an individual one-to-one. -one. Yeah. However, if you've planned it out, and in this case, what I have are on-demand videos, just in time. So if someone is ahead of my training plan... They, I can, they, they can go, Alex, I need help. I don't know how to process this thing. Don't worry. I've got three videos that are available on our SharePoint site and whatever it is. Click, boom. They watch the two, three minute videos, whatever it is. They've got the piece of learning. I've recorded that once, but the people that are uh, enjoying the videos, yeah. it's a small business, multiple times going on forever. So to answer that question it's succinctly, I think it's about being tactical with your resources and trying to understand what parts of your onboarding can be digitized that can then be just played over and over and over again. Yeah. My quick tip is micro learning. So the phrase micro learning means anything really ideally less than two minutes. So as an example, let's use uh, one up as the example. Um, how do I pull a report of my team? Like, let's just say that as a quick example. If you can explain that and how, where to click, where to, do all your buttons in less than two minutes that person will remember then the next video should be how do i drill down to get more info about a particular person absolutely N not putting them together separating yeah. those things makes total sense i like the idea of micro learning as well especially where being truthful attention spans are coming down thanks social yep. media tiktok <laughs> they're not really helping are they that's one of those um 
the thing around the whole just in time thing what's your kind of view or take as well on like video learning versus like in person because i know one thing that people would probably turn around and say as an argument to that is you know watching videos isn't in get isn't as engaging you can't ask questions it's not interactive it's convenient to produce but maybe not as convenient to consume as like an in-person learning session so if someone has to use your just-in-time learning to learn about the placement process for example do you then still follow up later on and do a proper training session with them? What does that look like? Oh, such a good question, Terry. So this is this is always the dilemma. I'm full of, these of me of, today, I swear. Yeah. Oh, I love it. This <laughs> is the thing with these kind of questions is that there's so many nuances. So yeah, absolutely. I if if I could be very honest and, and give a very bold opinion, yes, you can do videos. Yes, you can learn things online. I I like a podcast. I like audio. But but actually, there there is something about being with someone going through something. So if you ever said to me which is better, if you had to choose one. That that's better the in-person thing a million percent especially if you've built a rapport and credibility with someone they can ask you those very candid questions look i don't even know how to turn on the computer like those kind of if you've built enough respect with that person so coming back to your point though how do you do that well i so coming back to just in time this is where the planning process comes into play you go like right okay using data that's what where i come from on average these are made up numbers for the record, but it could be like, oh, I'm looking at the data. On average, a new starter gets a first interview approximately in their third week. So I need to have that training in the second week. So I'm going to do that training in the second week because then in the third week when they get their job, they're going to do it. Now, of course, yeah. it's based on averages here. So there will be people that are quicker. There will be people that are longer. So that's the first point is to try and go right in person to allow the questions. I want to try and get it before the general average is probably the yeah. best way to word it. Then one of my, I feel like I really am giving away a big secret here. I think the best learning, uh, especially in a sales room, is if you can record the calls. Now hear me out. If you can record calls or you can somehow give the ability for the salesperson to also witness or listen to what they have done, I could say anything hey, I thought that intro was really good. It'd be fantastic if you could get it a little bit shorter. There's, they have every right to go, I kind of disagree because they haven't heard it back. Mm. They can't hear it. So I'm a huge fan. So if we use sports as the analogy here, there are runners. If I use my wrestling as a real example, I do certain moves better than other moves. But the only reason why I've got better at certain moves is because I've watched it back multiple times. Yes. So there's a move called a suplex, vertical suplex. Lots of people do the move. The classic. Like, the classic move, right? But there are times where I would do the move and I look at it going, pardon my phrasing, everyone, if I offend anyone, but it's like, that looks so fake. That is so fake. And I'm looking at it going, but why, why does it look fake? But I'm getting coached by people saying like, oh, you need to kick your legs. You need to do this. You need to do this. And I'm like, well, I am doing that. But then I watch it back and I go, I ain't doing that. And the evidence can't be wrong. And let's say I did something else in the move and it made it look amazing. I might then make the, the assumption to go, actually, no, I am going to keep doing it my way. So back in the world of business, if you've got phone calls, if you're doing something that is somehow recordable, if you can play that call back to that person and you're not saying you're not having a go, you're not going to go like, look, I listened to the call. Let's listen to the call together. Look at these 10 things you need to do better. It's actually reinforcing the good. Like, mm. listen to this. Your intro was great. So good. Now, tell me what you think about that intro. Well, I think it was good. I like, the, like build them up. Give them a bit of an ego. Right. Yeah, this is good. This is good. And then my favorite killer question is if you could do that call again. What might you do differently? Hmm. And then what I love is, and as an L&D guy, I don't know what they're about to say. I might have an opinion or I might have what I think is what I need to say, but they might go, do you know what? I think that might have been a bit long. I'd like to get that a little bit shorter. And what's great is you're not the bad guy telling them it needs to be shorter. They've, they've realized it themselves. themselves. You're kind of guiding them to the answer. Correct. Because if it's obvious they've said the wrong thing or it's obvious they've offended someone, it's easier for them to hear it than you to go, I think you did that wrong because there's a bit of friction there. And I think when you're building a team, yes, you can have a bit of friendly competition. Yes, you can have a bit of friendly rivalry. But actually, if you've got a manager that's constantly saying you did that wrong, you did that wrong, you did that wrong. I don't want to talk to you anymore. Because I'm only doing me down. things. Yeah. yeah. So I think a secret weapon is if you can somehow bottle and capture these uh, moments in reality. There's, I have a harsh opinion about role plays. 
I'm not a lover of role plays. You can, if, if you've got a professional doing them, that's fine. If you've got a manager doing them, that's fine. But also, if like let, now, Derry, imagine we were role playing the podcast. We're sort of doubling up on the time. If you see what mm. I mean, we're, we're going to do it anyway. So let's just do it because yeah. you've trained me and prepped me enough. And if I do something wrong, you'll tell me on the next one. But if we did the role play, I've just spent an hour doing a podcast with you that we're going to do the podcast anyway. It's a bit like learning on the job. And if didn't, you've done didn't, the... didn't this, this, this is the this is the run through, mate. This isn't the real thing. Oh, oh right. Oh my god. Right. Okay. Sorry. It's <laughs> so like if you've got the on. I use the I use the best take. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. So coming back to the, the tactical thinking, this is why I think the onboarding is really important because if you get the onboarding right, you know they they know. They know what they're meant to say. They know what's expected of them. Mm. And actually now coming back to the retention, and this is arguably the third point, the checking, if you can record these things and then do a regular catch-up or a, what was the word? A calibration session is what I used to use. So when I worked at the bank at Vanquist, we would do calibration sessions between training, compliance, and legal, and marketing, actually, to make sure that when people were selling a product or collecting money, they were using the right language, and we would all individually mark the call. So you might go, this person was 9 out of 10 on report. This person was 10 out of 10 on the product knowledge, blah, blah, blah. But then you would calibrate the scores, and you go, oh, legal have marked them zero. What's happened? Well, actually, they said this word, and that is illegal. That is mis-selling. Is ah. it? And then without the calibration, as the trainer, I would never have known that. Mm. And it's those things that you don't know. So coming back to training, I think the L&D role almost needs like a different name because I had the privilege of being able to be like obviously friendly with all these departments. I became the middleman of like 14 different financial institution departments. I was the only consistent. So I was the only person from a business perspective that could go, I've noticed this in this department and this department. There might be a clash in the future we might need to fix that now. And that's the bit I love about L&D is you can... You're kind of like the steward of the ship in a way. Love that quote. Making sure the that. fleet's not going to have a horrible clash together. Absolutely. That's a million percent correct. Nice. I like it. I like it. Some really interesting takeaways there as well, which then obviously leads us on to our third and final point, a bit around collecting feedback. Now, this is the one that you didn't really have like a, a succinct description for in a way. You're like, okay, I've got one word. I've got onboarding. I've got retention. This last one... Uh, Feedback, I guess, is kind of where we landed on. Yeah. Talk me through this as well. How do you go about doing it? So this is where, now for the record, I'm going to say this now, Derry's going to get annoyed with me saying the following phrase, but oh God. this is where products like one-up sales are so good. Yeah, you know, I get annoyed by it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so like I love, so I'm a data man. Like I'm not super nerdy. Some people would say I am, but maybe because of my F1 loving like-ness that, it makes sense. If the data is telling me that you are going slower in that corner, do something different in that corner. So if we apply it to businesses, I used to love looking at all of the numbers because no one else is going to look at them in the way I'm going to look at them. A manager is going to look at them to go like, are you doing the work? A director and a senior leader is, again, sort of going, are you doing the work? I'm looking at it going, where's the correlation here? Why is your top biller the top biller? Why are they number one? Let's now go backwards. Okay, I'll stick with recruitment. Interesting. We target everyone in sending 15 CVs in a week. But actually, the top bill is only sending five. But they're getting five interviews. Ah, so their ratio is one to one. Okay. What are they doing that allows them to get one to one? So mm. that's as a quick example. So then you go, right, let me go to that top biller and ask them, well, why are you sent? You could do two things. You can go like, wow, you've got this amazing ratio. Have you thought about sending more CVs? Because you've got this ratio that's incredible. If you send 10 CVs, you might get 10 interviews. But then mm. they might go, well, actually, no, because of X, Y, Z. Right, I've understood that. And then you can apply it to the rest of the business. Top people do these things. But it also works the other way. Okay, this person's struggling. This person's, sorry to use the phrase, failing. This person's failing. Where, and I use this phrase with myself. Where in the training has it let this person down? Mm. What have I done? Why this person's not succeeding? So again, you work backwards. Okay, right. Well, they're sending about 25 CVs, but they're not getting any interviews. Okay, that's telling me that the CVs that they're sending are terrible. 
So why? What is it? Is it that they're not put that? So if I use the phrase pulling a job, they're not pulling the job right. They're not understanding the job brief. Or is it they don't understand what the candidates are saying and doing? Or is it simply they can't find the right people? So I've got three hypotheses there. I need to find out which one it is. So then I, because of the data about predicting, I can predict this person's now got a bit of a problem. Let mm. me go investigate, see if there's any other numbers that are similar. And then we can do some ad hoc in-person training to go, right. And if you've got the resources, one-to-ones are great because then you can show them. Now, I like getting people's permission. I like to go to the, the top billers and say things like, look, I need a favor. Do you mind if I use you as the shining example? Now, I'm going to do it anyway. But if I ask them, it shines them up a bit. Like, yeah, give them an ego. Like, yeah, well done. And some people say that's a bad thing. But I need them on side because I also believe there's a, there's a secret learning ingredient of, uh, I call it osmosis learning, but it's mm. learning through your peers. If you look at someone going, that person's great and I kind of want to be like them, I need to do what they're doing. And sometimes if you can butter up those, those top people, you can politely ask them, look, I know you only, you're only on the phone for an hour a day. Do you mind to set an example? Can you nudge that number up? Just, just help me out. And because you've built them up, I'm not saying they won't, that they will do it, but you might be able to get people going in the right direction. So coming yeah. back to this feedback piece, it's why things like One Up Sales are so good that I can just log on. And sometimes you get managers that are defensive. So if you're a director listening to this and you've got a team of managers, they don't want to admit to you that their team are failing. They're going to want to protect it. So if I'm a L and D guy that's got no skin in the game, and I'm just there to try and make everyone, I can see it and I can see it independently and go, okay, team one are actually behind team two and three, but team one aren't going to admit that. So I, as my professional job is to go into the, the right, okay, we're going to do some team one training. Now, if you've got egos to worry about, you might have to do some company wide training, mainly for team one. But if there aren't egos and people just want to sell more and make more money, you can just go like, right, hi, everyone. I've got an extra bonus training session for you. Three o'clock on Tuesday <laughs> or whatever it might be. And that's, that's why I love those tech because as an L&D professional, we can go into it and go, ah, interesting. That's that, 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 that. And then and essentially go from there. You can understand it. Yeah. No, I really like that, mate. That's a really cool way of kind of like doing that constant cycle of whether we need to reinforce or build on it better, right? Mm -hmm. So you have your kind of initial welcome. Here's your onboarding. Here's your initial learning. It's the kind of ongoing learning I've got for you for the next 12 months, but then also checking yourself, not just trusting on them to turn around and say, I need help here, but also checking where help is needed yourself using data and using that to inform further learning. Absolutely. Multi-pronged approach. There's a, there's a theory in learning and development called Kirkpatrick's learning um, uh, hypothesis. And he talks about the different levels of analyzing learning, but I'll get to the, the good bit. There's like level one, which is basically like, yeah, the training was great. Loved it. But that doesn't mean the training was good. Yeah, I just enjoyed it. And this is the mistake I made in my early career. I was like, well, they liked my training, so therefore it must have been great, but they haven't mm. learned anything. So it's then going into the different levels. And then there's like a layer four, which is actually, has it culturally changed the business? And it's hard to go like, yeah, we're a more sales focused business because that's finger in the air. Get, But actually, if you look at the numbers and you go, actually, I can see that in Q1, these are made up, in Q1, we got out the door as a whole business uh, 400 CVs. But at the end of Q2, we actually got out 600 CVs. And then you can go, right, okay, well, we sent more CVs, but have we converted more? Wow, look at this ratio. The ratio mm. has also increased and we've sent more. Right, we have definitely made an increase here. Yeah. But if you haven't made an increase, right, that's the next thing. We've got the volume. Now we need to improve the quality. Nice. Well, I love the data. Mm, you're a very data-driven L&D guy by the sounds of it, which I think is the thing most businesses would be blessed to have. One thing I am conscious of, we are coming up towards time, though. So I've got some kind of quick questions to wrap up on if you want to go for that. Go for Ready? it. First one, what is your proudest moment as an L&D professional, as a manager, whatever it is? Where, where have you seen success in someone else and you've been... The most proud you've ever been at that moment? I'm going to give you a real cop-out answer. Every single time a new person that joins a business with no prior work experience and they make their first placement, every single time without failure. Even if I tell myself I'm only 1% to do with that, I know that I'm, I'm happy. You've, you've made the difference, right? Yeah. I love it when some, especially like a grad that's never worked before, they've never done any other kind of job. And I'm sure it's their work. Don't get me wrong. They've had to, it takes two to tango. 
But my proudest moments are always, and this goes back to Vanquish days as well, when someone is achieving and I knew that I was there on their day one. Mm. I love that so much. That's amazing. And then to flip it then, horror story. Oh, yeah. No. And you're Mr. Positive, so this might be hard for you. Oh, this is hard. Because <laughs> even bad things, you can look at good things. But I suppose it's where... It's that great example of like the World War II um, uh, Spitfires. Like you can analyze data wrong. And mm. I've definitely done that before where the hypothesis is wrong. So the Spitfire example is Spitfires came back after the war and oh sorry, during the war. And there'd be loads of bullet holes. And they're like, oh, we need to reinforce those bullet holes. And they're like, no, these are the planes that got back. We need to reinforce the places where there are no holes. Because they're the go, ones that went down. Exactly. And that's where I've made mistakes, where I've looked at it the wrong way. Um, so I can't think of anything in specific, but there's definitely been times where I've analyzed the data going, well, I must be right. And then actually, two months later, you go, ooh, no. I was wrong. <laughs> oh, it's quite wrong there. <laughs> but as long as you course correct afterwards, it's fine, right? Absolutely. That's how I like to look at it. Amazing, mate. Amazing. Look, honestly, again, I said it several times in this podcast, mate. We could talk for hours about this sort of stuff because it's all <laughs> so interesting. And honestly... I've learned a ton just through talking to you, and I really hope anyone listening has taken some good notes down, because if not, I'll have to make sure there's a summary available to go through it, because some really <laughs> cool ideas there. Very kind. Alex, it's always an absolute delight, mate. You are as bubbly as ever. I never seem to find you in a, air quotes, quiet mood. You're always full of energy, full of beans, and I really appreciate you bringing that, mate. Any kind of send-off words you want to add to the end of the podcast? Well, thank you so much for listening. I suppose the, bit, the big one for me is don't sleep on your uh, learning and development. If you invest in L&D, I think you'll be pleasantly surprised with what you can do with your business. And even if that's so much not hiring someone into it, but make sure you're actually putting resource and time into it yourself, right, if you're a smaller business. Absolutely. If you assume that people can do the job because you've hired them to do the job, I get the logic, I get it. But actually, how many times could someone be like, I don't know how to do this one thing because you're using a word I've never heard before. Mm. At least if you sat down and went, we use these acronyms, this is what this means. If you tell them the obvious things, they won't be offended. But if you don't tell them, they probably won't ask. And I would rather teach them to suck eggs than they not know at all. One more golden nugget at the end for good measure, mate. Absolutely love it. Look, Alex, thank you. I'd love to get you back on again at some point. Maybe in a year's time, we'll see how things develop, what else you've got to learn and bring to the table and share with us all. But mate, thank you so much. And thank look you. forward to this one going live. It's going to be a real banger, I'm sure of that. <laughs> thank you so much. Have a good day.